Welcome to this edition of First Star Logistics in the Trenches with Dave Lapham's special guest is the legendary David Fulcher. And uh, I'll tell you what, legendary is an understatement, man. The impact you made on this franchise, three straight Pro Bowls, 88, 89, and 90. In 88, win the, uh, go to the Super Bowl, win the AFC Championship, go to the Super Bowl, and then go to the Pro Bowl. Is that the most memorable year in your career, do you think, David? Dave, I'd have to say so. Um, you know, just because that's the ultimate goal of playing a professional sport is to get to the championship game. Obviously, we didn't win the game, but, um, you know, at 23 years old, playing in one of the biggest games ever uh, was exciting. And it's also exciting to play against the San Francisco 49ers. So I'd have to say uh, outside of my kids having been born in this world, man, and the opportunity to play in the National Football League, that was the ultimate prize. So let's go back even to your, your high school days. John, John C. Fremont, senior high school. You and Eric Davis, I mean, two iconic Cincinnati athletes with the Reds and the Bengals, respectively, went to that high school. How well do you know E.D.? How well do you know Eric Davis? Eric and I are pretty tight, man. We, uh, we never kept out of touch. Um, and when I got drafted by the Bengals, Eric was probably, you know, top five people that, you know, I found my number and called me and said, hey, man, congratulations. Welcome to Cincinnati. Can't wait for you to get here. So it kind of made an easy transition for me coming from Arizona to get to Cincinnati. Don't know anybody coming from 80 degree weather to 20 degree weather. Uh, and Eric was a significant part of uh, getting me acclimated into Cincinnati. So we, we're, we're, we're pretty close. I guess so. Two great athletes. No question about it. Um, did you play other sports? Obviously, besides football in high school, did you did you have other interests athletically? Yeah, I did. And Dave, to be honest, man, I, I was a baseball player. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I, I wanted to play football, but my dad pushed, you know, other sports on me, uh, played tennis, uh, played basketball, played football. And, you know, ironic, man, when I came, became a senior um, after I got out of high school, I got drafted by Atlanta to play uh, to play catcher. And I didn't want to catch because in high school and I had this big growing pain from, you know, 5'10 to 6'2" and my knees were killing me. So I, I played first base my senior year in high school and they still drafted me as a catcher and I didn't want to play catcher and my dad wanted me to play baseball. But fortunate for me, Arizona State said, uh, we'll get an opportunity to play football and I got a scholarship to go there and play. Arizona State, uh, three seasons you played at Arizona State, you had 12 interceptions, four as a freshman, two as a sophomore, six as a junior. I mean, that's the thing about you. The nose for the football, the instincts that you have, God-given, or was it something that you developed over the years, or what was it? How did that all come about, David? So, you know, it, it's funny, Dave, because I was that lazy guy. I remember Jim Anderson telling me that, you know, Rock, if you would have worked your tail off, you probably could have played three or four more years. And, you know, I'm not I'm not sure if I, I – I thought I worked out. I mean, I thought I did the things that were necessary because I, I did what was necessary, but – uh, when I look back at it, I go, oh, man, eight years could have been 12 years. Um, you know, maybe some more Pro Bowls, maybe an opportunity to do other things. But uh, I was that lazy guy. But, you know, and I don't I don't recommend players play the way I played because of laziness. But uh, I just I just found a way, as Dick LeBeau used to tell me, you guys got to make plays. And I, I made plays. So is, is it the perfect marriage, David Fulcher and Dick LeBeau? You know, Dick LeBeau went to Pittsburgh with Troy Polamalu, and, you know, he's like, oh, they let him use his instincts and just make plays. David Fulcher was doing that well before Troy Polamalu. Was that just something that Dick LeBeau really believed in? If a guy had a good gut feeling about things and good instincts, he'd trust him? I, and I think so, Dave, because I can recall uh, when I first came in, LeBeau told me that he had a conversation with uh, Paul Brown and said, don't be alarmed, Coach. I'm bringing in this safety. He may not look like one, but he could play. And that's what LeBeau told me. He says, listen, I'm going to create an opportunity for you to be successful. And that's where that zone blitz came in. I always try to tell people that Pittsburgh didn't start the zone blitz. We did. But but what LeBeau had in Pittsburgh and in Troy, you know, Troy was obviously a little smaller than me, probably much faster than me. And he had the instincts as well. So Troy did the same thing I did here in Cincinnati. And, but I used that 240 pounds instead of 205 in Troy. So in 1988, the SWAT team is born. I mean, the, the Bengals secondary becomes one of the most famous units in, uh, in Bengals history. 
What do you remember about the guys and, and the SWAT team in general? Well, let me tell you, man, that was an, a unique uh, group of guys. And not just the four guys that played, but the Ricky Dixons, the Barney Busleys, the Ray Hordens, all those guys that played with us. And we just, just created havoc. <laughs> right. You know, if we wasn't hitting people, we were not, if we were not, we were covering people. And the SWAT just came out of nowhere. It was like, okay, so we've got, we got sharpshooters, we got snipers, we've got, uh, you know, guys that just go get it. And we, we felt that if we could just play like somebody going in, taking out the enemy, you know, and, and, and creating good things on the football field, we could be very, very creative. And then we came up with the SWAT team. And I'm not even sure if it was, I think it might've been Solomon Wilcox or Eric Thomas thought up the SWAT team. And then we just started figuring out, hey, listen, let's, let's, let's see what this thing looks like. And let me tell you, it, it, it grew and blew like wildflowers. It did, it, did. it, was, a, it was a marketing, uh, a marketing company's uh, dream, no question about it, the Bengals SWAT team on the back end of that defense. Super Bowl 23, um, it's, ob- it's got to be bittersweet. Didn't win the football game, but in the biggest game of your career, Dave, you stepped up, man. You, you had a sack. You had a forced fumble that the Bengals recovered. You made a lot of big tackles. You made a lot of big plays in that football game. What's your mo- most memorable mo- moment in that game? Well, it's funny, man. The most memorable moment of the game was before the game um, when I saw Roger Craig out on the field. and I'm, I was just – at all the San Francisco 49ers I'm gonna play against them Montana Jerry Rice John Taylor you know just you know just the guys of just people you look at and I remember walking past uh Roger Craig true story Dave you know I, I remember as if it was yesterday I, I put my hand out to shake his hand hey man I'm at all man good to meet you how you doing and he blew me off really like, you kidding me I mean here 23 years old. And I'm like, dude, I just wanted to, you know, shake your hand. And lo and behold, I got a chance to not shake his hand, but hit him in the chest and he fumbled. And Dave, as I'm sitting here, I remember that play, like I said, it was yesterday. When he fell to the ground after I made him fumble, <laughs> I said, if you'd have just shook my dad, we might have been pretty good friends. And from that, from that game on, from that that was that that particular instinct or instant, I, I just, something happened to me. And then when Timmy went down, I think some of crumb ride was inside of me. Okay, Dave, you gotta, you gotta protect the line of scrimmage. You gotta protect the secondary. You gotta, you gotta play for two people. And I, 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 I felt like I had an extra body inside of me that game. Yeah. You mentioned Tim crumb obviously going down early in that football game and and earlier in the week, Stanley Wilson, you know, has has his yes. difficulty, and and you guys get hit with a you know with a one two gut gut punch really, you know, that week as you're preparing for the Super Bowl. How big of a of a factor do you think those things were? Well, I, I, Stanley's impact was was, uh, and I say this, man, it's almost like somebody just passed away, because Stanley had a a, a cologne that traveled throughout the locker room. Yeah. We smelled the cologne, we didn't see Stanley because we had been in that locker room warming up and warming up. We get in there, Super Bowl uh, pregame, and we could smell that Stanley was in there. And he wore number 32. So his locker was right next to mine. And we walked into the locker room. There was an empty space of Stanley, but his, his equipment was still there. Hmm. And we knew he wasn't going to play. And it was like, oh my gosh. It, it was so quiet in our locker room. Normally, we got music playing, guys were talking. We had no, there was nothing said. So basically, where we were, man, we were we were in a position to say, okay, um, now what do we do? And I can I could tell that our offense wasn't the same offense without Stanley. We ran the football. We we dominated people. He was a he was a blocker that went after people. And we didn't have him. And then to have Timmy go down, it was, okay, man, we are against the odds here. And what do we do? And I'm going to tell you something, man. We played out of gut determination. You know, we, we, we had our backs against the wall. We had the number one offense. We had a defense that played really, really well in the playoffs. And we did not want to lose that game. And 
day we were we were that close man to bringing it back to cincinnati very very close yeah there's absolutely no question about that it's it's a uh a tough tough memory there being close and not quite able to close uh close the deal 50 takeaways you're responsible for in the course of your storied career 31 interceptions third most in bengal's franchise history the only guys with more kenny riley lewis breeden but you got the most of any safety by a wide margin 10 forced fumbles, nine fumble recoveries, 50 takeaways. Is that is that basically you in a nutshell? I mean, taking the football away from people? Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. Yeah, you know, Dave, I, it, it's funny, man, because my rookie year, if you look back at our film and rookie year, I came off the field every third down. They brought Ray Horton in. I used to get mad. I used to look at LeBeau and say, hey, coach, I can play. Let me get out there. And Think about that. My my rookie year, I was in. On, I don't think I was on any third down. You know, long down situation. They took, and I, I got frustrated. just like I did when I went to Arizona State, and they wouldn't let me play wide receiver. I got frustrated, and I'm thinking, okay, and I I just believed that I was. I don't know if it was my mindset to be a takeaway guy more than it was create something, David. Create havoc. Yeah. Whether they run the football and you the guard or you knock out the fullback or if they threw the ball down the field and you knock somebody out or you knock a receiver loose from the ball or you went and got it and I think that's where my wide receiver instincts came in because I, I played basketball on the football field I went up for a rebound and when the ball was up I was going to get the rebound and that's how I did what I did two different times three interceptions in one game um, you know you're tied for the record but you've done it twice which is uh, quite remarkable. Those, any big memories from those particular games that, uh, that you want to talk about? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Houston Oilers, I had three. Kansas City Chiefs, I had three. Um, we didn't like Houston. Yep. So every time that Warren dropped back pass, we, we tried to, we, we knew it was coming. Hey, man, some of those interceptions that I, you know, the, the Odell Beckham one-hand interception, some of those I had with one hand and never knew I did it. Um, <laughs> But it was just having a knack for where the ball was going, being in a place at the right time. And I, and I credit a lot of that to Dick LeBeau because of the zone blitz and just the defense. Hey, David, you're going to rush or you're going to drop off? You're going to go into the flats or you're going to go to the, to the curl? And I was like, if I just follow this, I could make plays. And a lot of those plays were made because he said, when you feel it, go get it. And that's what I did. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's pretty remarkable, really, for a coach and player to have that kind of relationship, that kind of trust, and that's, you know, that's a that's such a key. There's no question about it. I remember talking to you in the locker room after a few games and say, when you made that play, what did you see? And you're like, you know, I can't really describe what I saw. I just felt it, and I knew it was going to happen, and it happened. I mean, you know, your your instincts were just something that were uh, unbelievable. And and you're right, Dave. I mean, and that's. You know, as a as a former player who's coached a little bit in high school, coached a little bit in college, I used to always ask my players when they come off the field, what did you see? You know, because I, I, I think I see something from the sideline. But on the field, you see more than I see. Right. I've always, I mean, if I was coaching today, and I wish I was, players make plays. Coaches put them in position to make plays. So if I ask a player, what do you see? and they tell me this, then when you go back in there, I'm going to give you the, the green light to make that play. And that, that's what LeBeau did for me. I had so much freedom, so much freedom. And a lot of people, you know, my teammates would say, dude, I can't believe you did that, man. Why did you come over and do that? I said, but did I make the play? <laughs> it's because that's what LeBeau told me to do. And it happened a lot, Dave. It happened a lot when I was playing. And I'm just appreciative because, I had the ability to do it and he gave me the green light to do it. And when I, when I would, when I would blitz, I would make sure that Eric Thomas or Lewis Billups, Hey man, cover me. 
I make sure the outside linebacker cover me because I'm going because they, they, they never watch me. They never pick me up. And it's funny because I've talked to guys today, John Jackson, Cincinnati. Yep. I used to talk to John and I talked to other people. And they would tell me when they saw 33 on the field, dude, we, we pointed everything to 33 because if we didn't, he knew, we knew he was coming. <laughs> we knew he was coming. And, you know, I, I was just so successful with it, man, that I, like I said, I'm, I was a lazy football player making big plays. No if I wasn't a lazy football player and played it the way I was supposed to, who knows what my career would have done. But Dave, I, I wouldn't turn it. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. Yeah. I mean, you made a huge impact on the organization, the fans sixth on the list of the all time Cincinnati Bengals when the Bengals had their 50th uh, anniversary. You're also active in fundraising and do a, doing a lot for uh, charities here in Cincinnati. You're, you're a give back to the community kind of guy. Fill, fill us in on what's going on with David Fulcher's life in that regard. Well, like you said, Dave, the, one of my first uh, organizations that I, I put together was my wife, Judy, was diagnosed with MS right. over 23 years ago. We started a foundation, the David Fulcher Foundation, benefiting those who are affected by multiple sclerosis. And for the last 15 years, we've donated you know thousands and thousands of dollars to those who are affected with MS. Not the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. We wanted to do an on-hand approach. And our approach was, how do we help those people that are affected by it? So we would go grocery shopping, clothes shopping. Around Christmas, we would deliver those six or seven, eight hundred dollars worth of stuff to those families. And we've probably helped over 50 families in the last 15 years. And then we started the, the program that I'm currently involved in again with, uh, it's called MANA, Mentoring Against Negative Actions. Right. Where my wife and I go into the Butler and Hamilton County jails. And we just have backyard conversations with people who are the inmates on making change, doing something differently. You know, and, and once again, talking to them like they're humans and like they're people instead of somebody who's incarcerated who got in trouble. And then we got together with our golf tournament, and you played in our golf tournament a few times, which is the, the Wave Foundation, Newport on Aquarium, the David Fulcher's Putt for Penguins Foundation where we raise monies and we do things, conservation, where we take animals to the schools and to people's homes where they, they don't have the opportunity to go into the, uh, the, the Newport on the Aquarium to see those animals. And Dave, I've been, I've been involved with everybody's foundation. I mean, Munoz's, sure. you know, things that you do, things that everybody does, Joe Walters, those guys. And I thought when I retired from football that I would stay here in Cincinnati because this is my home. And a majority of us live here in Cincinnati and we give back. We give back to the community. And, I, and, and Dave, it's not, even, it's not even a blink of the eye when somebody asks me, hey, man, can you? If my date is available, I'm there. You know, I'm coming. And, I, I, and I've always been the kind of guy growing up in Los Angeles that if I have the opportunity to give back, I'm going to do it. Because it was given to me. It was given to me. And people took the time out to hear me. And I want to hear them. Well, you're, you're a special guy. And uh, you had a great career. And you're doing great things still for the community. And we appreciate you visiting us today, David Fulcher. You are definitely a Cincinnati legend in, in all forms, uh, every sense of the word, not just the sports world. So appreciate your time, my man. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, brother. You know, and like I said, Dave, I'm, I'm just a blessed guy. You know, and I was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame uh, this past year. Yeah, uh, right. Congratulations. Which was great. You know, and I, I, I've been on this ballot. I've been hearing it for 15 years. And. Um, I finally got an opportunity to hear it. I got the football delivered to my house, so I knew it was real this time. And um, like I said, man, I'm just fortunate. I'm blessed. But my life will not change because of the accolades and the things that I've done and I continue to keep doing because I know that I'm giving to them and that he upstairs is going to give to me. So I appreciate, man, being on here with you guys. And, you know, anytime you need me, man, I'm a phone call away. Thanks very much, David. You're the best.